Hello everyone, this is County Historian Larry Tippin. We've been doing a series on the small towns in Putnam County. So we're gonna talk about Rochdale today, small community, North Central Putnam County, population of just under 1,000. Some of this information came from a book recently written by Malcolm Romine, very nice book on Rochdale. We also have a 1969 history and some other histories prior to that that are in the Rochdale Library on file and available to the public. In Malcolm's book, he asks a question about the name of Rochdale and what this Stumpstown and Langsdale have to do in relation to Rochdale. And I also go add that maybe why Rochdale should have been spelled with an E in the middle of it or as two words. First, we'll look at some maps. This is an 1864 map of Putnam County, and then an 1878 map of Montgomery County. These two maps aren't proportional to each other. You put them together, basically, you see that the railroad that we commonly call the Monon goes through those two counties. This area in green is what would become Rochdale, but 1864 has just two dots on the map, the home of Henry Klein, and Elijah Grantham, although we do see that Brooks Baker owns about 230 acres, part of what uh, part of that now is what's Rochdale. This the land that was become Rochdale received the first land patent in January of 1831. Land patent is when the United States government issues the first deed of property to the settlers. In January of 1831, Hiram Ball, Jacob Hoots receives their land patent, and then Noah Elrod later that year. Henry Klein then came in 1834, and then Grantham and Brooks Baker. You see the road that we commonly call the Rochdale Bainbridge Road. As it goes through Rochdale, we see that in 1864 it crossed over the railroad and went north on the west side of the railroad to a lot of land that's owned by Robert Lockridge. And then when you get into Montgomery County, you enter Ashby, Ashby's Mills Post Office and Station, also known as Forest Home. And then above that, you see the steam sawmill. They gave Ashby's Mills its name, Silas Ashby and John T. Ashby with the Ashby's in that area that operated that. And this little cross type thing, that's the cemetery that was on the farm of Jesse Ford. We'll talk about that. And as you see, as you go um, just south of the Montgomery Putnam line, you'll see a community called Stumptown. It's had just to be a collection of early homes. None of them show up on the 1864 map. We have a lot of documentation saying that Stumptown was just south of the Montgomery Putnam line, just south or across from Ashby's Bell. Then we go to the 1879 Putnam County Atlas and Historical Record. The first history of the county includes maps of the county, townships, some of the history, such, and also biographical sketches of some of the early settlers, including those two dots on the map that we saw, Elijah Grantham and Henry Klein, who both got their mail at Ashby's Mill, just north of Rochdale. We also see there's a handwritten book, it's called Postmasters, 1832 to 1971, maintained by the post office department where they kept track of the post offices and the appointment of the postmasters by their date of appointment. So we see at Montgomery County, Ashby's Mill got its first post office in 1857. And then in Putnam County, south of what was to become Rochdale, the major community at the time was Carpentersville. And this got its post office in 1854, which was the time that the railroad that we call the Monon went through Putnam County. 
Then we go to the 1879 map of Putnam County. We see that Lockridge, who had owned a lot of the land north of Rochelle in 1864, still does. We see Henry Klein, Elijah Grantham. But now the 230 acres that Brooks Baker had owned is split evenly between Cassandra Lewis and Mary Jane Baker. Those are ones, not sevens. That's 115 acres. Cassandra was the daughter of Jesse and Elizabeth Radford Ford. Her first husband, Brooks Baker, died in 1865, and he's buried at that Ford Cemetery about three miles northeast of Rochdale with two infant daughters that were apparently born and died in 1855. Then it was Cassandra and Mary Jane for about 10 years. And then 1875, Cassandra married William Lewis. William Lewis is buried at the Mount Pleasant Cemetery south of Bainbridge with his first wife. And Cassandra is buried at Rochdale under the name Cassie Lewis. Mary Jane Baker was born in 1858. So she was seven when her father died. And he made provisions that when she came of age, she would receive half of his land, which we see in 1879. She's now 21. Then in 1883, she marries Albert Kalk. Then we go to some deed records. In the office of the Putnam County Recorder, we see that in July of 1879, Cassandra Lewis, formerly Cassandra Baker, and her husband, William Lewis, and her daughter, Mary Jane Baker, only child of Bricks Baker and Cassandra, convey and warrant to the Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railroad a strip of land 100 feet in width. And then we also see in April of 1879, Mary Jane Baker, an unmarried woman, also conveys and warrants to the Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railway a strip of land. And then December of 89, we see that Elijah Grantham and his wife Nancy have also deeded some land to the railroad. So this is most of the land of the railroad, the East-West Railroad, that goes through Rochdale. But in October of 1879, <clears throat> we see that Elijah and Nancy Grantham plotted out a town that they called Rochdale, two separate words, two separate words, in October 30th, 1879. And we see in the plot of Rochdale, the original plot, there are four blocks bound to the north by Railroad Street, West Street, South Street, and East Street. Somebody later wrote in Walnut. Bisected by Center and Meridian Street. Then you see the Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railway and the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago Railway. And this is the rail line that connects the two, which is still there. You still see it. And that's what we cross when we go north on Indiana Street now, out of town. These two maps came from the Sanborn Map Company. One of them is 1902, one of them is 1910. What the Sanborn Company did was they mapped out various cities and towns and looked at their buildings and saw whether they were brick or wooden, one story, two story, whether there was water nearby or if the uh, community had any kind of firefighting apparatus. And these Sanborn maps then were used for the underwriters to write the insurance policies, came to be known as Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. And both these two maps, they have those four blocks in the original plot of Rochdale, now bound by Railroad, Indiana, Columbia, Walnut Street, bisected by um, Meridian and Washington Streets. It's the same both these maps, and that's as it is now. We'll look at these same more maps. They're very valuable research tools. We use them quite a bit. And this is where it all began. As we noted, the Monon Road, the North-South Road, went through in 1854. And then the East-West Road, the one we commonly call the B&O, 
went to Rochdale in 1880. We look at the Sanborn map from 1902, we see that the railroad station was in the southeast corner of that intersection of the two railroads. We also see just west of that, the Rochdale Novelty and Veneer Company, which produced high quality walnut, veneer, and other wood products because of the native timber nearby as did the Roadster Handle Company, provided hickory axe handles, ice broom handles, and so forth. And we also see the Electric Power and Light Company. The Handle Company began operations about 1895, and the Electric Light Company was incorporated first in 1899 as the Roadster Electric Light and Telephone Company. Now, both these two businesses produce products that they're able to sip really anywhere in the world. You could go north to the Great Lakes, south to High River, all the way to the East Coast, and all the way to the West Coast. And both these businesses had international companies or international customers, I should say, believed at the height of the production that they employed between the two of them over 100 workers. Then we see a grainy photo the Baltimore and Ohio train going west through that intersection. You can see the Rochdale station gracefully going through the intersection. Then we also see on November 15, 1929, a couple of trains did not so gracefully go through the intersection. The eastbound passenger train of the B&O apparently due to brake failure or some other mechanical problems, failed to stop at the intersection, entered the intersection just prior to a 72 car freight train going north on the Monon. According the newspaper reports then, seven were hurt, although no fatalities in the accident that occurred at 12.15 on that Friday. Of those seven that were injured, four were football players from the James Millican University of Decatur, Illinois. Two were cooks on the B&O train, and then the B&O train master. I assume they mean what we call engineer now. Let's talk about those two railroads, how they came to be, and the progression. The north-south one, the one we commonly call the Monon began in 1847 as the New Albany and Salem Railroad Company with James Brooke as president. One of the primary investors was industrious Austin C. D. Paul of Salem, Indiana. If that name sounds familiar, it should. They initially had 33 miles of track linking Salem, Indiana to the High River at New Albany. Then they extended the rail line north, reaching Greencastle on March 17, 1854. And by the end of 1854, they had gone all the way to Michigan City, connecting the Great Lakes to Ohio River. By 1858, that rail line is in the hands of the investors, who the next year in 1859 reorganized as the Louisville, New Albany, and Salem. Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago, excuse me, Rail Company in 1859. In 1881, the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago consolidated with another line to create a rail connection from Chicago to Indianapolis for the first time. In 1897, it reorganized as Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railway, and soon it became to be known as the Monon, but had not officially adopt the Monon name as its corporate title until 1956. And then in 1971, the Monon was merged into the Louisville-Nashville railroad system. By 2004, it had been acquired by CSX. The East-West Road was Indianapolis, Decatur, and Springfield Railroad which was organized in September of 1875 after they acquired some assets of the defunct Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad, which was never completed. 
The new rail line was constructed from east to west with the construction completed in early 1880. We know that mostly because we can read the news of Fort Red, which was in northeastern, extreme northeastern Putnam County, where they would highlight each week the events that occurred during the previous week, who's seeing who, who's barn burned down. And then we know when the railroad was graded, when the tides were delivered, when the bridges were built, most importantly, when the trains began to run, which was on February 9th, 1880. That rail line was taken over by the Indiana Decatur and Western Railroad in March of 1885, but by 1894, that rail line was struggling financially and effectively ceased to exist although there still ran some trains. After lengthy litigation, it was acquired in 1897 by the Chicago, Hamilton, and Dayton Railroad Syndicate, which has several lines, including the Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Western, which took the name of the former Indianapolis, Decatur, and Springfield Railroad. And then in 1927, that line was acquired by the Baltimore and Ohio with the B&O. And then it ceased to exist in the 1980s. That rail line's gone, except for a few short stretches of track. This is back to the 1864 map. We see this dashed line that goes through Groveland, Bainbridge, and Morton as it crosses Putnam County. It was the proposed route of the Indiana and Illinois Central Railway, which was never built. That rail line was organized in 1853 by Judge Addison Locke Roach, an attorney from Rockville, Indiana. And after he couldn't make that line uh, successful, he began the Indianapolis Cater and Springfield Road. He's the first president of both those lines. He was able to get a line through Roach Day in 1880. But in 1876, after they had acquired the assets of the former Indiana and Illinois Central. They had a proposed route, which they were going to call the Indianapolis and Springfield, that went again through Groveland and Bainbridge, but now extended northwest through the first major community in early Putnam County of Blakesburg, and then leaving the county just north of Portland Mills. That line was never built. And we know now that the line was successfully built going through Wheaton, where apparently they put the wheat on the train. Roach Rock and Russell, this is an 1895 rail map of Indiana with the Putnam County cut out. Let's talk about this guy, Judge Addison Lock Roach. He's a native of Tennessee, graduated from Indiana University, practiced law in Rockville in the 1840s. He was elected to the state legislature in 1847 to represent the Rockville area. He was a circuit court judge in Marion County and then a justice on the Indiana Supreme Court from January of 1853 to May of 1854. He stepped down because of the low wages of being a justice on the state Supreme Court and practiced private law in Indianapolis, then moved to California where he died in the afternoon of six. So if you want to read quite a bit about the rural life of Judge Roach, you can go to the Indianapolis News of April 25th, 1906, page 10. And this is not a typo. He did spell his name with an E on the end of it. So that's why it was suggested maybe Rochdale should be spelled in a similar manner, but it's not. Let's talk about this Langsdale thing. How did Rochdale have a Langsdale post office at the beginning. We can see from that postmaster's publication we talked about earlier, at the Langsdale post office, William B. Lewis was appointed postmaster February 3rd, 1880, but by February 24th, the name had been changed to Rochdale with Lewis still the postmaster. And just for fun, I added the Raccoon and Wheaton post offices who both began in 1880 as one would expect when the railroad went through, Rockland and Wheaton being west and east of Rochdale, respectively. In the 1879 Atlas of Putnam County on page 42, they have a full page 
on the Green Castle Banner and its editor and proprietor, George Langsdale. So many have felt because of the prominence of George Langsdale as editor of the newspaper. Rochdale was named Langsdale in his honor. That is not what happened at all. Let's find out what really happened. This is the appointment of postmasters, again, very hard to read, read, but we say in Greencastle, the postmaster from 1874 to 1885 with George Langsdale. So in addition to being the publisher of the paper, he was also the postmaster of Greencastle. This is an article from the Greencastle Star, February 28, 1880. Not the banner, not Langsdale's paper, but the other one published in Greencastle. Let's read about what happened. Blood or justice, an outraged and enraged community, North Putnam, demanding satisfaction for an insult offered them by the Post Department. The some have had said twice. The circumstances are as follows. At the crossing of the Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railroad and the Louisville, New Albany and Chicago Railroad, a new town was plotted and the necessary papers were placed on record, which means the plot of Eliza Nancy Grantham of those four blocks, the original town of Rochdale. And also the article continues, by agreement between the citizens and railroad companies, both the station and the town, were named Rochdale. Continuing, it notes that William B. Lewis is appointed postmaster at the crossing of the two roads, and when this last named petition was sent to the nation's capital to the post office department, it was suggested the post office be named Langsdale. Assistant Postmaster General Tyner granted this request and asked that Lewis be commissioned postmaster Langsdale PO. The people are irate that such a name be saddled upon their town and demand a change. The article continues that Langsdale, the postmaster of Greencastle, <clears throat> when interviewed in this matter, reported to have said the people of Rochester had better consent to the name given to them by the post office department, for he could be of great benefit to the town due to his elevated and influential position. He went on to say that he suggested that the town should consider renaming itself from Rochdale to Langsdale, but that never happened. The town was never called Langsdale, only the post office, for those three short weeks in February of 1880. It's further charged that Langsdale was the first and only person to suggest the town be afflicted with his name. It goes on to say that some men have honors thrust upon them and others never had any honor and no act of mortal man can make them ever appear honorable. That adequately describes Langsdale. So what he did was in his position as the postmaster at Greencastle, he literally intercepted the correspondence from the town of Rochdale to the nation's capital crossed out the word Rochdale and wrote his own name in instead. Follow-up article a few months later, again in the Greencastle Star, saying the post office at Rochdale will henceforth be known by that name, Assistant Postmaster General Tyner, who apparently was the one in charge of signing the names, of corrupt memory, having been forced to abandon the christening honor of his pet Langsdale, the irate citizen demanded the change in the order and the change went. So that's how the town of Rochdale had a Langsdale post office for just those three weeks. Not in the honor of George Langsdale, but quite dishonorable on his part. Rochdale was incorporated March 25th, 1882. And then in the 1883 session of state legislature, we see that bill number 397 was an act to legalize the incorporation of town of Rochdale, Putnam County. All right, now that we know about the founding of the town, how it got its name, and some of the early citizens, the founding citizens, let's look at some pictures and have some fun with this. This is one that says 
uh, Rochester, Indiana, Washington Street. It doesn't say where, but we can tell where it came from, where it is, by looking at some of the buildings and so forth. So we see right here that there's a tree indicating that there's no building, a one-story, two-story, an alley, another two-story, row of one-story buildings, and then across the street, a half block, two-story brick buildings. And then past this alley, we see a one-story brick building and a two-story brick building, a barber's pole, and they've had some sort of parade or something, so we see kind of a reviewing stand off to the right here. And this gentleman is dressed in some sort of a period costume. This is not how one that lived in Rochester would dress at this time. So let's see if we can figure this out a little bit with our... We want to see, first off, that second building has a distinctive brick inlay type design of four and a half um, inlay blocks, whatever you want to call it, about 12 feet by three feet. And you see the barber's pole and the hat that's on this guy. They also see a very neat picture from 1908 saying Rochdale. It says Goldie and Helen McGurdy, probably the name of the two horses. They're lined up the three rural route deliveries of Rochdale getting ready to deliver the mail, it appears. It's been cut off up here, but somebody had written in George Newell at the left, and I typed that in on this. This isn't on the photo. I typed this in. And then this gentleman right here, more than likely, was the postmaster, who is Charles McGoy, or McGay, I'm not sure which, who is a postmaster of Rochdale from 1904 to 1913. So I don't know if George Newell is the name of the horse or what. And we also see that same building, the second building down, that had that distinctive inlay design. So we were asking Pete the Barber, Pete the Barber is retired, but he comes in the Rochester Library frequently, if he knew where this, where this uh, buildings were. They, they didn't look familiar to us currently. And he said, oh sure, that's on the north end of Washington Street, the north side, excuse me, near the west end. So we went down, took a picture of that. Then we found out that this building had been a two-story building, apparently damaged by a storm or something, I think in the 1930s. We see that the doorway sets at an angle. And then we see the second set of buildings has a distinctive four and a half brick inlay. So we to go to the maps. Those sandbar maps that we talked about, here's the key. They give information about how many stories the buildings were, whether or not they had a firewall, the types of door, the types of windows, and so forth. And then the ones that were yellow or wood frame buildings, the red ones are brick and the blue ones are stone. So that's good information to know. So we look now at the corner of Indiana Washington Street, northeast corner. We see, in fact, there is a doorway at an angle, a two-story buildings, the first one being the post office. And then down here we see there's an empty lot, or that tree probably was, one story, two story, an alley, another two story, which the opera house is on the second floor, and then finish off with a row of one story buildings across the street, two story, except for this one, which is where the tri Canyon Bank is currently located, which is a one story wood frame building. This is from 1902. We go to 1910. We see the same door that sits at an angle, although the post office is no longer here because it's been moved to down here. And then we see the opera house. Now, the first floor, I think it's kind of neat, it says moving pictures. And then the, there's a stairway that goes into this second floor building from the alley. So that's still there today. You can still see it, maybe even the same stairs that look particularly safe to me. And then the row one-story buildings, which includes drugstore, printing, grocery, and another grocery, drugstore. And now this building is a two-story brick building. And then also down here is the barber shop in 1910. 
So we can say with a great deal of certainty now that that first one, I tried to cut and interpose the photo of that parade I had or whatever it was, was about right here at this corner, but looking east. And then where those horses were lined up, probably about this area. I think it's pretty neat with those two photos. And now that we know where their location was. Look at this photo. It says Rochelle's last jail, with an implication there had been at least one jail prior to this one. I see it's a brick building. You see it's got a, it's one story with kind of a fake front. And this is a current photo, which we believe is the same building. If so, that front had been kind of taken down a little bit for the roof. This wooden door, this is private property, so you can't really trespass. But if you were to open the door, you would see the same bars that were still there. So we believe that photo of the last jail is this building, which is just west in the alley, but west of the VFW. So look at the maps. This is 1902. We see in that alley, the VFW in 1902 was a wood frame whole green eggs. We see farther down was a brick building, which clearly was a jail. And then look in this picture, it's kind of interesting. We see the Central Hotel, which is a wood frame building or a series of buildings actually, which was the first hotel of Rochdale. And then wood frame buildings to the west of that. And then across Railroad Street in that grassy area between Railroad Street and Railroad was a lumber yard. And this is Indiana Street to the left here going north and south. And we see just west of that, slightly south, was Hotel Inman. And then down here at this end of the alley on the south side were two brick buildings, one of which is a drugstore in 1902. Up to 1910. And we see the jail still there, but it's located about here now. So this building here, which is now brick, says Polk Green Eggs, is the current VFW. This building here, which is what was the Central Hotel, is not labeled as such in 1910. And then the lot to the west of it is now vacant. Those wood buildings in 1902 have been taken down. See the hotel in it again. But down here, this brick building at the end of that alley, which had been a drugstore in 1902, is now the Higgins Hotel. Let's talk about these two hotels. This is a, a very cool, uh, poor quality photo, but it serves this purpose of the Inman Hotel. We can see from 1902, it's a two story building with a basement, wood frame, with a two story porch that's 100 feet from north to south, which is exactly what we see in the photo. Now, ironically, we've seen an elevated wire. Uh, water tower right behind the building. Ironic because the building burned to the ground in 1918. Now this building, the reason it was built, if you wanted to go say from Indianapolis to Chicago, there was no direct line in 1880. So you would go by rail, maybe to Greencastle, or Greencastle Junction, or to Rochdale, to wait on a train going north to Chicago or south to Bloomington or Louisville. And the wait may be anywhere from a few hours to a few days. So this hotel was built basically for the travelers. And then many of them were men, of course, as men would do, they started playing cards while they're waiting. Probably friendly game of euchre, or maybe gin roaming or something. Soon to be other games of card games and dice and so forth were introduced. And money started changing hands. And before you know it, this became the major gambling center of Western Indiana. It said it at its height, gamblers were coming from far and wide just to gamble at the Emmon Hotel in Rochdale, some as far away as from Chicago, St. Louis, and so forth. To get it burned to the ground in 1918. But one of the earliest businesses and probably other activities were going on upstairs as well. We'll talk about that. But then in the 1910 Sanborn map, we see, as we saw earlier, the Higgins Hotel. It's one of the neat things about this is you see that it, the, the building on the north, the portion on the north, 
doesn't go all the way to the front, which is exactly what the photo of the Higgins Hotel looks like, because you can see the porch. This is on, uh, it's a vacant lot now. It's on the alley between, that goes east and west from the VFW to the fire stations down here. The town buildings, the town offices are just the south of this, against the vacant lot now. This building was about to fall in, the, I think in the 1980s, it's still standing, and it still had a few residents, and it caught fire. The firefighters were really upset because they had to run in because one of those residents had a menagerie of exotic animals, such as snakes, ferrets, and so forth. They didn't want these animals to escape their cages and terrorize Tanner Ridgedale. And fortunately, they got them all before the building burned down. This is some of the loose leaf histories in the Russo Library. For Martha Higgins, is celebrating her 100th birthday. It's very neat. It said she was born January 1st, 1855, near Carpentersville, and lived her long and colorful life near Rochdale and in Rochdale. She was affectionately referred to as Aunt Matt, and delighted that she'd received a telegraph from President Eisenhower. This was noted as being June 2nd, 1955. Let's talk about the newspapers. Russia has a very long history of newspapers. This was an article written by Bob Hudgens in 1950, again, in the older files at the Russo Library. It's a very long article, and I cut it into pieces for presentation purposes. But he starts out by saying the first newspaper was the Indiana Statesman, which began in 1882, published by Howard and Joshua Hennon. By 1883, Howard's left, and then Joshua is the sole proprietor now, and changed the name of the four-page weekly to the Rochdale Press. By 1892, Charles and Ellen Moore had bought the paper and moved it to the Wendling Hardware Store, which was Jones Grocery in 1950. And then they changed the name to the Rochdale News. On Horse Show Day, May 19th, 1894, the Wendling Hardware caught fire, destroyed many of the buildings on the south side of Washington Street, Rochdale. And the hopes there was floor weakened by the fire gave way and the printing press crashed down to the hardware store and the damage was irreparable, it says. So then they moved, I believe, to one of the upstairs buildings on the north side of Washington Street near the east end and then across the street to the south side. And then in 1902, Charles Moore sold to Lynn Ware and Robert Green, and then published the news in what was called the LaDon Diner, or LaDon Theater, excuse me. It's a very interesting article in Malcolm Romine's Russo book about the LaDon Theater that's worth reading. And then Green died in the 20s. And then during the Depression years of the 1930s, Editor Ware went into partnership with George Edmund Black of Greencastle, who assumed the title then of editor, and merged the news with the Putnam Times, a defunct Greencastle weekly of uncertain heritage. And then this evolved into the Times News. Black left not long after that and left Len Ware as the publisher of the Times News until he died in 1938. When his widow sold half interest to long-term employee Willard Silvey, they published the paper until Silvey was called to the Army in 1943, and then Mrs. Ware died the following year in 1944. And that which time they sold the paper to the Putnam County Graphic, which was published until 1969 when that building burned to the ground. It was located about a, a block south of the Courthouse Square in Greencastle, the northwest corner of Jackson and Walnut Streets. At that time then, the graphic merged with the Daily Banner, became the Greencastle Banner Graphic. So you see that our current newspaper had some Rochdale newspaper heritage to it and history. And this is 
edition of the Times News, consolidation of the Putnam Times Virtual News, published November 22nd, 1933. It says volume number whatever, but it's really the first newspaper of the combined Putnam Times Virtual News. So you can get this, read this from the Hoosier Chronicles online. It's free and available. It's a very, very nice resource. You can just do a search for Hoosier Chronicles and you can find these newspapers. Very nice. Let's talk about this photo. This is a real cool photo. It shows some of the early men of Greencastle who had lined their cars up in front of the Hicks, Curry and Son Buick dealership on Railroad Street. Where this building is located was that empty lot we saw in 1910. And this we believe was the former Central Hotel through those trees. So this building is built after 1910. It's had many uses, including the Lions Club, the Optimus, the building still there, still in use, it's been painted white, the front's different, the windows have been a cement block inserted, but you can tell it's still the building. And it's a who's who of the Rochdale men. You see Raymond Crosby, Lockridge, Ernest Thompson, Hicks Curry, Britton, Bradford, Drake Brookshire, we believe this is Thomas Drake, the son of the first Drake, and father of Ed Drake, who passed away not that long ago. Then the Jeffries and Willard Goff. Very nice photo. We think this photo was taken about 1923 or so. We can kind of support that a little bit by looking at the obituaries of Hicks Curry's wife, who died in 1927 with a newspaper and obituaries said they had moved from Rochdale to Shelbyville about five years prior. And then in the obituary of Hicks Curry himself, who died in 1943, said that he and his son moved from Rochdale in 1924 and started the dealership in Shelbyville. But then he more or less handed it over to his son and then was involved in real estate. A long-term member of the Rotary we see that he was president of the Orlando, Florida Rotary Club in 1930. So he's spending time in Florida and in Shelbyville. This is a photo courtesy Putnam County Public Library. It just says funeral carriage, Rochdale question mark. We're not even sure this is in Rochdale. We looked all over all the buildings and all the maps. We just can't find a freestanding two-story brick building like this. So it may not be Rochdale, but it might be uh, uh, something that didn't show up on one of the maps. But this is what an old style funeral carriage looks like. Let's talk about this. This is on the south side of Washington Street near the East End, the old grocery store. And then this little brick, a little bit of red brick there on the right, was Pete's Barbershop. Again, Pete's retired now. But Pete gave me my first haircut in the early 60s. I remember I noticed that to the left there of the entrance of Pete's Barbershop, somebody had spilled what looked like about a gallon and a half of red paint on the sidewalk very carelessly. And I thought to myself, how much trouble would I have gotten into had I spilled about a gallon and a half of red paint? The town had to replace that sidewalk about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And then where the red paint was, they put this red block to commemorate the events that occurred in the morning of June 2nd, 1891. Now this wasn't a random thing. It wasn't a Wild West shootout. There was a lot of backstory to it. So let's study that. And let's Let's examine the three principal players in this little drama that led up to those events. The first of whom was Noah Evans. The Evans family was from Groveland. His first wife, Mary, died in 1875, leaving Noah to raise four children. Noah's brother, Harper Evans, was convicted of killing Lydia and Tilgram Hannah in their sleep in Groveland. January 31st, 1861. That's a whole nother story. We're not going to really talk about it other than the relationship of Noah Evans and his brother Harper. The trial of Harper Evans began in the second week of April, 1861, about the same time 
Fort Sumter was fired upon starting the American Civil War. Now, after the trial was over, the jury convicted Harper Evans to life in prison. But before he was sent to prison, but while he was still in the county jail, either he had smuggled in a pocket knife himself when he was first incarcerated, or somebody else got him one, but he tried to cut himself, um, he cut himself in the cheek and his um, jugger vein. They found him in a pool of blood early one morning, almost dead, but they revived him, sent him to prison in Jeffersonville. And about two years later, which would be about 1863, Noah went to visit his brother in prison. So if you know your history, you know that a lot was going on in 1863. That was when the Battle of Gettysburg, the Siege of Vicksburg, and most importantly, Southern Indiana was terrorized by Morgan's Raiders, July of 1863. So it probably didn't take much to Noah, for Noah to convince the prison authorities that his brother Harper had died. And he'd like to take him home to bury him with his family. So they agreed to let Noah load Harper into a coffin and take him home. When they arrived home, Noah took the lid off the coffin. Harper jumped up and ran off, very much alive. The family loaded the coffin with a block of wood and buried it in an unmarked grave. And then about a year later, people started seeing someone with a distinctive scar, like in the window at night and so forth, for about a month or two. And then no, and it stopped as quickly as it, abruptly as it started. So they believe Harper had probably gone out west and assumed a new identity or something or another. But this is to tell you how Noah Evans was involved. There was suggestion that he had helped his brother Harper with the actual crime, or certainly um, hiding and obscuring the evidence, but there's never enough evidence to bring Noah to trial. He was never charged in that gruesome murder in 1861. All right, let's talk about Minnie Mills. Minnie Mills was the daughter of Floyd and Miranda Mills. The family lived about two miles north of New Maysville which is about four miles southeast of Roadsdale. On a gravel road that ran east and west, it's still a gravel road today. The farm, which was on the north side, is now a nature preserve of the state. The father died young at age 32, leaving Miranda to raise four children. We see her in the census records then, in 1860, 1870, and 1880 with his four children, living with various family members. She raised those children, and they grew up to be respectable members of the community. One of the children, Bruce, was a school teacher and postmaster. Susan married William Millman of the Millman family of the Canaan Church area, northeast of Elmore and south of Groveland. Then Minnie was the last. She was born about 1856. They didn't have birth certificates and birth records then. You have to determine the age based on what somebody's age is in the census records to determine their birth. So she was born about 1856, about the time before father died. And then in 1881, Minnie Mills is now 25, and she marries Noah Evans, the widower from Groveland, who is 41 years old at the time. At the time they married, Minnie was only four years older than the oldest of the Evans children from his first marriage. And Minnie was said to be a very attractive young woman. And then the third person in our little drama was Dick Adams. He lived a couple miles north of Rochdale with his wife and three teenage children. The newspaper accounts and other primary source documents for resource never said exactly where, they just said a couple miles north of Rochdale. He was not exactly an upstanding citizen, ran a saloon in Rochdale. Then he developed a substance abuse problem for which he was treated by Dr. Ross in Wayne Town in Montgomery County. Then after he was successfully treated, Adams offered to help the local people then treatment. He put up flyers and put out other words that he had the ability then to help treat someone who had a substance abuse problem. And in the meantime, Minnie, Minnie Mills Evans herself had developed a substance abuse problem, somehow connected with Doc Adams, 
as he began to call himself, either through those flyers that he was putting up or mutual acquaintances or whatever, and she agreed to be treated. Then as now you would go to what's the equivalent of the treatment center, which was Doc Adams' home north of Rochdale with his wife and three teenage children. Mrs. Adams was said to attach her husband and the lovely Maddie in some compromising situation, more than one possibly, suggested that she caught them either in an embrace and or Doc Adams was going down the hallway toward Minnie's room at night. So Mrs. Adams asked Minnie to leave, which she did, packed her bags, went back to Groveland. But Minnie and Doc Adams kept up a correspondence and sometime prior to the events that occurred June 2nd, 1891, we don't know the exact date, a son of Noah Evans opened the letter, addressed to Minnie, which contained a mysterious white powder. Like, you know, what's this, Dad? Noah Evans was outraged, absolutely outraged, demanded Doc Adams pay $100 for shame he has bought to the Evans family. And if he did not pay that $100 by a determined deadline, Adams would die the death of a dog. About midnight, April 30th, 1891, someone unknown fired three shots through the window in the home of Doc Adams as he was lying in bed. One of them was lodged in a window, but two hit Doc Adams. Neither one were fatal, one in his left ribs and one in his left shoulder. Many believe that Noah had fired these shots, but he denied any involvement and there never was any evidence to charge him. Fearful now, Adams moved his family into Rochdale. Now that we know the background and we know the story, we can start with the events in the early morning hours of June 2nd, 1891, where Noah Evans at their home in Groveland noticed a bulge in the corner of a uh, carpet, lifted the carpet up and saw a letter or possibly more than one letters, but one of which Adams had written to Mitty with a formula for a poison that she should use on Noah. Noah was, of course, outraged, confronted Minnie, who confessed everything. Noah hooked his speedy horse to a two-wheeled buggy of some sort and took off from Golvin to Rochelle, about a seven-mile trip, arriving the early morning hours at 7.30 in Rochdale, where he tied his horse in an alley near Job's Hardware, which we believe is across and south of the current Tri-County Bank. He asked the first person he saw happened to be Moses Payne where Adams lived. Moses Payne pointed out the house but said Adams was not home as he had just seen him sitting in front of Al Rice's drugstore about 100 feet east of that alley. Where he was showing the wound to his left, left shoulder, the 18-year-old daughter of the druggist, Rosa Rice. Noah then walked out the place Adams was sitting with many in tow. Adams was kind of looking down in great misery, happened to see these two sets of feet, two legs, walk by, assumed that they were going to continue on by, but they stopped in front of him instead. He looked up where Noah asked many, is this the man that caused you the injustice, only in much more vulgar language that I'm going to use today, because he needed to know for sure he had the right person. Many said yes. Noah pulled out a revolver from his coat, began firing directly into the physical person of Doc Adams. Miss Rice ran into the drugstore. Anybody else who was in the street went back inside, of course. And then Manny ran back to the alley and untied the horse. Adam stood, took a few steps from the street, but fell back to the sidewalk and gutter in front of the drugstore of George Irwin, about 25 feet east of where the first shots were fired. It's kind of interesting to see these two different drugstores are 25 feet apart. The newspaper accounts and other primary source documents didn't say if they were on the same side of the street or across the street from each other but we know where it ended. After emptying one revolver, Evans pulled a second and fired two more shots directly in the back of Dr. Adams' head, eight shots total. Satisfied with the job, Evans turned and proceeded toward where his, his wife was waiting with the horse and buggy. After going about 100 feet, although probably not quite that much, he stopped 
in front of the shop of Dodd and Ed, which were standing in the entryway. And other people are starting to come out now. The, the shooting is done. The smoke's starting to clear. Brevin showed the men the letter that Adams had written to many with the formula for the poison to use on Noah. Noah then gave a long speech to anyone that could listen, waved the letter around. Now he respected the townsfolk of Rochdale, but he was compelled to satisfy the honor of the Evans family, feeling fully justified in his actions that morning. Noah then hopped on the buggy with many and left town going east, where they went to Lebanon, Indiana, where a relative of Noah's is an attorney, because Noah's going to need some legal help at this point, where he's advised to spend the night at a different relative in Coatesville. The following morning, he got on the Vandalia train, went into Greencastle, turned himself into the sheriff, confident a jury would agree that he was justified in his actions of the previous morning. Turned out they were not. He was convicted to life in prison, where he died about 30 years later of cancer, we believe, in Michigan City. Many then went on to marry Lawson and Collier. Someone asked once about these two really neat old brick homes on the north side of Rochdale, North Indiana Street. So we decided to research them, found out a lot of valuable and interesting information. This is the one on the east side, about halfway up the railroad to the end of town on Indiana Street. Went to the county's property tax records, which is available online and saw that the current legal description says Lewis Lot 7. This is actually a current photo, but you can see it's the same house that you can see today. And we know that Cassandra Lewis had developed the east side of Indiana Street, which she owned, from Railroad Street going north in 18 lots in March of 1887. So what we do then is we want to determine when um, improvements were made to a property. We go to these books, the county auditor's office called the appraisement list transfer of real estate, and this one for Franklin Township. And these books are in four or five, maybe six year blocks of time. So what we do is we look that if a piece of property had no improvements at the end of the previous book and had improvements at the end of the current book, we know improvements were made during that time frame. So we can kind of narrow it down now. So we see that Lewis, Cassandra Lewis has these pieces of property, which were the west side of Indiana Street, which she did not develop, but she sold um, in, I say, traditional manner, the part of the northeast corner of the northwest section of portion of section 13 and so forth, so on. But she subdivided the east side, we can see the 18 lots. The first three were bought by James Anderson Rice in the summer of 1887. And then his son, Joseph William Rice, purchased lot seven in the summer of that year. And then it further says to go to Rochdale book for the improvements, which we did. And I cut out those pieces to see that Joseph W. Rice, Lewis lot seven has $600 worth of improvements at the end of this period. So we know that that house was constructed sometime between June of 1887 and June the 1st, 1892. But we also see up here, you can't really read it, but there's also $600 worth of improvements on the west side. And we trace that farther. I actually had to abstract that. Found the 14 owners from then to now with no break in ownership. So we have direct provenance to that $600 worth of improvements to this house. This is a picture on the north looking south of that house, but it's on the west side of Indiana Street, a little bit north of the other house. Matter of fact, you can see that other house to the left here, south of this one. And you can see also those two houses had the same distinct decorated brickwork over the windows and then the trim, the last work, the same. So in this house, according to that record we're looking at, was built 1889. So the other house was probably built about the same time. This was built by James Price, father of Charles and Joseph Price. 
He acquired this property in June or April, I'm sorry, of 1887 from Cassandra Lewis, built a home in 1809, and then he sold this home to his son, Charles Franklin Rice, in December of 1895. So you have these two brothers living across from each other in these two old houses until 1900, when this house was sold to Albert Lockridge. The house was recently remodeled and there, there were some cancer checks found of the Lockridge dairy. But Lockridge did not build this house. He'd acquired it from the Rice who built it in 1889. Another thing that's very interesting, we go to, we're looking through some of these books and we noticed that Brooks Baker, before he died in 1865, had significant improvements. It looks like over $1,000 worth of improvements in those 230 acres that he owned, most of it on the 160 acres on the west side of Indiana Street, where that second house is located we're looking at. Interestingly enough, there's no dot in the map in 1864 for Bricks Baker, but there had to be. Improvements would be a home, barn, fences, or any other improvements to real estate for tax purposes. That's how you assess your tax through those books. So I had to have a house somewhere, or maybe more than one even. I don't know. Before he died in 1865. Okay, so remember those Rice brothers and their father, James, as we talk about the library. A literary club was organized in 1904, headed by the, life, the wife of a local minister. And then a committee was formed to try to acquire books and find a suitable reading place for their libraries they were going to use. So they found in August of 1912 a room on South Meridian, which had been a doctor's office, and had over 300 books at that time, some on loan from the state library. With this encouraging start, they formed a library board by some of those first ladies and also other prominent citizens of Rochdale. And then they found out the Carnegie Corporation was granting money for libraries to construct libraries. Now, Carnegie wasn't just throwing money out. You had to have an existing library and you had to prove and already have a means to raise taxes for the local citizens to financially support a library in the future. And also, you had to have a structure and the personnel to do so. In the state library, there were, in fact, able to obtain a $10,000 grant from the Carnegie Corporation. This is the actual grant award letter still on file at the Rochdale Library, very neat. We're seeing July of 1913. They were notified they were gonna get $10,000, starting with the $2,000 and then in increments. Also at the library, they have the actual architect's drawing for the libraries, which is so cool. And then, the bed for various components, painting and so forth, of the interior of the building, but the exterior building are mostly by the CF Rice. You see that it's just under $9,000. The library board agreed to a few change orders as was building constructed. They wanted the side door to be slightly different, whatever. But anyway, Rice was paid just a little bit more than the $9,000. The rest went to painting and shelving and so forth. So we believe the C.F. Rice was this Charles Franklin Rice, who we had just talked about, left 1865-1953. And we think the bricks may actually have been made in Rochdale. Those sandbar maps did not cover the entire town. They went as far north as Railroad Street, but they had some insets for um, small areas of interest, including this one which was the brickyard of James Anderson Rice on North Indiana Street. Now that was Charles Franklin Rice's father, so we think the bricks were more than likely made right there in Rochdale. It's very neat. This is the accounting system where they tracked the payments. You can see the first $2,000 received from Carnegie. This looks like a loose left, I don't know, steno pad of some sort. Payments to Rice, and then the architect, who was Hannon, 
and then other payments for painting and various things, all the way down to $24.66. Then we see some more uh, loose letter type things where they have the change orders, and then a bunch of scribbling on the back of an envelope probably constitutes that other $24.66. That's very neat. The cornerstone then for the building was laid on July 30th, 1913. The building was constructed or completed and dedicated January 8th, 1914. The Richdale Carnegie Library then has evolved in the Richdale Franklin Township Public Library, a very nice library, very nice collection, and very well run. If you live anywhere near Richdale, in the 60s or 70s, the highlight of your summer was the Rochdale Fourth of July celebration, where you had you could ride the rides, they had a fish fry, you had um, Sheldon's pick a pocket. He was a radio personality, Jim Sheldon from Terre Haute. He had his pick a pocket show on the front steps of the library. I remember that. Large crowds, car shows, and everything. The 4th of July celebration kind of died out by the late 1970s, but by the 1980s, they resurrected a roach race to commemorate Roachdale. I remember the 4th of July celebration, the highlight was when they shot off the fireworks at, dar at dusk on July the 4th, which was the largest firework display anywhere around at that time. I have neighbors now that shoot off more than we did at Roachdale. But at that time, that was really neat and really the only fireworks around. That's very neat. And do you know that Rochdale had a resident that went down in the Titanic? This is John Crafton. I put the photo on top of the newspaper article to commemorate that. Crafton made his first fortune in Bloomington and around Bloomington in the limestone business. He moved to Rochdale then later in his life where he's going to make a second fortune in the timber business. His house was at the west end of Washington Street. If you go all the west from the main downtown business district, Rochdale, the very last house you'd see, the road would drive literally into the front porch of Crafton's house. So we call that the Titanic House. And then we continue to read that newspaper article where William Irwin, apparently was a friend and neighbor of Crafton, had sailed with him to Europe, leaving New York, on the ship Cincinnati, where Crafton was, Crafton was gonna to go to Europe to take the Carlsbad treatment for rheumatism, but he's homesick. Constantly complained how he's homesick. He originally had a passage to come back on April 17th, but he exchanged it for a first class ticket on the Titanic, which sailed a week sooner. That ticket cost the equivalent of about $80,000 in today's money. So he sailed with the first class passenger, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, and so forth, and went down with the ship in 1912. Talk about the events that occurred the very early morning hours of December 16th, 1931, where the residents were Rochelle were rudely awakened with a series of explosions. It's believed that about 10 men, roughly, came into Rochdale at about three o'clock in the morning, the early morning hours. Several of the men went right into the bank. A few of them posted guard at the end of the street and then the alley across the bank, behind the bank. But two of them went to the power company, the electric light company, and cut the wires, plunging Rochdale into total darkness at three in the morning. One of the men went to the train station where a man named Jarvis was on duty. They knew that he would be there, the night watchman. They took him to the jail. We begged them not to put him in the jail. See how uncomfortable that would have been. So they instead they took him to the telephone exchange, which was on the second floor of that series of buildings, where 17-year-old Marjorie Smith was on duty, manning the telephone exchange, and her seven-year-old sister Pauline was with her. The men set four charges of nitro timed to go off several minutes apart and had more than enough to do the job. This safe was three steel doors, one of which was found near the entrance to the bank, splintered all the furniture, shattered the windows, 
And then the boss went off, of course, the people of Rochdale jumped out of bed. And across the street at Fowler's clothing store was Monk Fowler's. There had been attempted burglaries during the weeks leading up to this, and he was spending his nights in the store. So he woke and he exchanged gunfire with one of the men posted to guard this robbery. Behind the bank, someone else exchanged gunfire with the guard back there. There were casings and shells found in the door frame. But fortunately, nobody was hit. The bank robbers knew what they were doing. They either from reached jail or they really knew the town very well because they knew that there was two safes. The smaller one only had mortgages and stuff. And this is the one that had the money in it. This is the photo that shows the insurance adjuster with the president of the bank. Galen Irwin and the head cashier Nathan Call. The men made off with about $4,500 of cash and negotiable instruments, which the insurance covered. The insurance also covered about $1,000 worth of damage to the contents of the building. There were several other robberies in the months that followed in smaller towns north of Rochdale, like maybe New Ross, New Richmond, I don't remember. And one of which there was a shootout where one or two of the men of that gang were hit and maybe killed. So that was the end of that crime scene. This is a photo of the telephone exchange. This is not from the time or with the people involved in the robbery. It's just a really neat photo. You can see from the Gibson girl style hairdress the women had and the length of the dresses. This picture was taken probably about 1900, give or take. But after the robbery, the operator on Deirdre Marge Smith found an open line that apparently the men failed to cut, called the sheriff of Green Castle who came up. By the time he got there, the robberies, uh, the robbers were gone. Okay, let's move five miles west on what we call now 236. We're at intersecting State Road 43 to another community that's so related to Rochester that we need to talk about at the same time. We can see in this area, we see that Robert Lockridge owned a significant portion of the land, the same Robert, Robert Lockridge that owned that land north of Rochdale. We see also Donahue and Koshaw. This is 1879, before the railroad came through. And then we see in March of 1880, Donahue and Koshaw, or Koshaw, however you pronounce it, plotted out the town of Lockridge which was to be north of the railroad and from the county's current property tax system. We see basically between the old State Road 43 and the current 231, this is one of the lots from the current system and it's still called Lockridge. The legal description is still the town of Lockridge. But when the railroad station came in, it was called Raccoon Station. We see the Sunday School class of Fincastle went to Raccoon Station where they boarded the trains and the Annapolis Decatur Springfield Railroad and went to Montezuma for an excursion. And then we see in November of 1889, the news from Finn Castle saying that Uncle Bailey Trail, who runs the mail transfer wagon between Finn Castle and Raccoon Station, had left its faithful horse, Toothpick, standing near the depot. Further saying that when the train pulled in, Toothpick pulled out. And after going several circles, landed in a sawdust pile. The horse was okay, some damage to the wagon. Swear words in abundance, which you can only imagine. But then, when a post office was needed in that area, instead of calling it Lockridge, it was called Raccoon. So here we go again. We have town plotted out as Lockridge with a Raccoon station, train station, and then a Raccoon post office which was operated from 1880, then intermittently in 1934. So the, it's not as quite as mysterious and difficult as it was in Rochdale. The progression is February is when the trains went through and they probably put the train station, they named more than likely in honor of the Raccoon Creek, called it Raccoon Station. And then that was in February, then Lockridge was planted in March of that same year of 1880. And then the post office started in June being called Raccoon. You can't talk about Raccoon without talking about this guy and the Wilson Brothers Greenhouse, founded by 
the geranium, undisputed geranium king, Coley Wilson. There's a very nice article in Malcolm Romine's Rochdale book written by a descendant of Coley Wilson, Gannett Brothers, and it's very interesting to read that article. It tells you all about the Wilson Brothers. Now here's a photo, not a very good quality photo, 1952 with Banner, where they show Coley Wilson, apparently an employee, looks like Luke South, and then John Howard and Don Wilson. Don Wilson lived to be, I believe, 102 and died just a few years ago. And then we're going to finish with this. This is a photo on the entryway of the Rochester Library where you can see members of the 1923, approximately circa 1923, Rochester Bainbridge Combined Band. And if you can stop and look at this picture, you can see a who's who of the residents of those communities' time. But I want to point out on the front row, fourth and left, was Dana Wilson, who's sister of the Wilson brothers. And she is very involved in the Wilson brothers' greenhouse. She went on to marry Jack Porter. And then the second row, the far left, was Richard Veach, who was a doctor of Bainbridge for many years. So, okay, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the founding of Rochdale and some of the early history and some of the events that occurred in Rochdale.